Welcome to Opalesk TV. Today we have Charles Stuckey, Chief Investment Officer of Guggenheim Investment Advisors. Charles, can you introduce us to your professional background and why you joined Guggenheim? Absolutely. I started my career as a U.S. dollar interest rate derivatives marketer uh, back before Bloomberg had pricing models. Uh, within a year of that start, Bloomberg came out with pricing models and market efficiency kicked me into investment banking instead. I spent about five years as an investment banker and then joined Morgan Stanley's alternatives business, really is Employee 32 and what was at that time a startup fund of hedge funds and fund of private equity funds effort. In 2003, our team at Morgan Stanley made an investment in Guggenheim's first aviation fund. That's how I got to know Guggenheim. I watched the firm in its early stages. I watched the progress of that investment and uh, became very, very interested in what was going on uh, really within that, that portfolio company. After several years of dialogue, I joined Guggenheim in 2006 and have been in the uh, family office and uh, advisory business since. Tell me what your role is specifically, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and also how your division sits within the corporate framework of Guggenheim Partners. Guggenheim Partners is a diversified financial services company. The company has an asset management business, an insurance business, an advisory business, and a treasury services business, and a capital markets effort. The advisory business is really the external allocation, manager research, and investment themes practice. Within the advisory business, we run a family office, we run a suite of fund of funds, and a hedge fund platform. My role is to be the chief investment officer of that group, uh, and within that role, it's my charge to really develop and guide uh, the practices of the investment team. Charles, with so many managers out there, how do you comb through that universe and find the right managers with whom to invest? In the manager selection business, uh, there's a lot of time spent on discussing a bottoms-up due diligence process. That's absolutely important, and we have one that's very rigorous and very robust. Uh, but our starting point for manager selection isn't really at the manager level. We're very top-down in our view. We start with trying to understand what is our role of capital uh, in different markets. We look for places where our capital is dearly needed, and we try to avoid places where capital is abundant. With that view, we go out and we try to figure out, okay, what markets have a return opportunity for private capital in a 2 and 20 fee structure. Once we understand where that capital need is, we go out and find the best traders uh, to execute for us in those markets and really manage the platform and the strategies as if we were running an outsourced uh, multi-strat effort. Charles, can you get a little bit more granular as to how you look for the right managers and particular indicators that appeal to you or appeal to your team? Absolutely. Coming out of the financial crisis in 2009 in the U.S., Europe started to tremble. When we saw that, we changed our research focus really from heavily focused on work in the U.S. to focused on the opportunity set that was emerging in Europe. Our first starting point was credit. Uh, we looked deeply at, at credit providers and credit managers in Europe, and that led us to conclude that there was more value in European equity than European credit. So from a top-down perspective, as we evolved the platform and as we evolved our strategies during that period of time, a big part of that was exiting strategies that were more conservative, sort of pre-crisis uh, placeholders, and moving into more aggressive European equity strategies. And what are some other strategies or opportunities that you find compelling in this current market and going forward? We think event-driven strategies are extremely compelling right now. Mm -hmm. uh, our time horizon is really kind of in the two to five year range, and we think a number of factors are converging to make the service of providing event enabling activities in capital markets attractive right now. For example, sort of crisis to present, uh, companies have spent a lot of time delevering. Balance sheets have been, been cleaned up. While they've been delevering, ROEs have been going up and earnings have been going up. That's exactly opposite of what a finance textbook would tell you. A finance textbook would tell you that you take on leverage to increase your ROE. So CFOs have been getting a free ride. Mid to late 2012, uh, that began to change. Earnings began to mean revert. ROEs began to fall. And yet, at the same time, credit prices or the cost of financing remains very low. So we believe that corporate CFOs will be very tempted to use leverage and do other types of corporate event transactions to maintain or continue to grow earnings and ROEs in an environment that's becoming increasingly competitive for them. These events include things like restructurings, share buybacks, recapitalizations, and mergers and acquisitions.
But with treasuries at two percent and equities are at a full PE, how can investors reach their allocation goals? It's a real challenge today. Equities and, and equities and, and core fixed income are the two building blocks of most people's portfolios. These are the mainstays that they've been leaning on. Um, and you know, depending on their return expectation, these can be challenging in, in today's marketplace. Generally, look to get five percent pensions, six to eight, and most high net worth investors do have an eight to ten percent expectation out of their portfolio, regardless of market condition. If the ten-year Treasury does have a two-handle on it, you can go to high yield, but high yield is in the five percent today. Back when I started my career, AAA rated municipal bonds were in five percent on a tax-exempt basis. Uh, so this is a challenge. What it begs is the question of where do you go? You have to find more specific and more active uses of risk to be able to bridge that return goal. So we're looking in places like event strategies, we're looking in long short equity, we're looking at global macro strategies as opportunities for increasing in one case the safety of the portfolio through the hedging and the risk management of the strategies as a replacement to bonds and maintaining what we believe to be some return capacity in the portfolio with respect to the you know both of those asset classes generally. How do you deal with the potential investor temerity or fear of going into alternatives, into hedge funds? What do you deal with from a behavioral standpoint? How do you convince investors that alternatives do make sense and will fit well within their portfolio and achieve their objectives? When we talk with investors about looking at hedge funds as an asset class, we get two pushbacks. First pushback that we get is, is liquidity. And uh, we would have two comments there. First of which is, uh, most people don't need the full liquidity they maintain in their portfolios. So having an honest discussion about what your liquidity budget should be allows you to sell off a portion of it and earn a return for that. You don't need, you know, investors shouldn't keep an asset in terms of liquidity that they can gain profit for uh, if they don't really need it. So that would be a starting point for that discussion. The second comment that we, would, that, that we get pushed back on is, you know, we've had a great bull market in equities recently, and frankly, bonds have done well. They've done well for the past several years. They've done well for the past 5, 10, 20, and 30 years. So with good returns coming out of something as seemingly safe as bonds, it's been hard to move people into alternatives. Alternatives, on the other hand, as a class, have been earning around 4 to 6% over the past several years. That hasn't, that hasn't excited anyone. It's important to remember, however, that alternatives are, in many cases, a defensive vehicle. Hedge funds, you know, even having hedge in their name, are a defensive asset rather than an aggressive asset. Ten years ago, Treasuries plus five was considered a home run in a hedge fund asset. Today, Treasuries plus five is five percent. That looks a lot better to me than the two plus percent yield on a tenure. So what is different or unique about your investment approach? We really define our approach by how we frame risk and how we frame opportunity. When we'll start with risk. Most people who come to us come in the context of, of preserving wealth as opposed to you know, making a multiple of what they have today. Our clients tend to be very wealthy families and advisors who represent very wealthy families. With respect to maintaining wealth, our, our practice really starts and is grounded in the concepts of behavioral finance. Uh, we engage Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel laureate in the field of behavioral economics, uh, to advise us in dialoguing with clients. And one of his principal observations is that people see a dollar of loss as twice as bad as a dollar of gain is good. That sounds absolutely obvious when I say it. You're nodding your head. Whenever I tell someone this, I get nods around the table. But most of modern finance doesn't practice such a simple risk dictum. People use volatility to gauge risk. Volatility gives equal weight to upside and downside risk. I can't remember the last time I had a client criticize me for having too much upside risk in their portfolio. So we start with careful risk management on the downside and constructing portfolios to accommodate people's view of loss. On the return or opportunity side, when we frame investment opportunity, we aren't framing by allocating to product-based asset classes. We don't have a hedge fund allocation. We don't have a private equity allocation in a dedicated way. We allocate by factor risk. Our equity allocation can include passive equity, long-only equity, long-bias, long-short, activist, event, and private equity. So alternatives are really a core component of our portfolio strategy, 
not a peripheral component of our strategy. And I think that's a key difference. Charles, you're a big critic of risk parity. What about this concept do you think is misinterpreted by a great deal of investors? And why are you so outspoken against risk parity? R risk parity is very popular today, really coming off the back of, of some success of some, some flagship funds that have employed the technique and frankly delivered some astounding track records. That said, you know, an attractive track record alone to us is not a reason to adopt a framework. The framework relies on equal weighting either between concept risk or purely volatility. Equal weighting on concept risk is still weighting by risk as defined by volatility. And therein lies our problem with the strategy. Volatility doesn't capture, in our view, a description of risk in most financial assets. So people will say, you know, on one hand, we believe in non-normal risk. We believe in fat tails. We believe in black swans and extreme risk. And on the other hand, they'll say, but we're going to adopt risk parity or value at risk, or we're going to use the Sharp or Sortino ratio, which are all volatility-based frameworks. Volatility doesn't work in non-normal situations. It's only mathematically valid when a distribution is normal or quasi-normal. So one can't stand in both of these camps at the same time. Anything got as far as investment opportunities or strategies in the current market and going forward? Within our practice, uh, one thing that we've been doing over the past really two years is we've been uh, largely exiting the directional credit market. This is one of the hardest things to do in a client dynamic because these are top performers in portfolios. The credit market has had a fantastic run and a really fantastic run on a risk-adjusted basis. So when you exit credit and you show people, we know we want to we want to reduce or eliminate a manager that's been a top driver of performance in your portfolio, you get a reaction. On the other hand, what we're bringing to people are we're bringing to people ideas in long-short equity. We're bringing to people ideas in, in now today, we're bringing people ideas in macro space. And these are some of the you know, underwhelming performers over the past several years. So again, we're selling into or talking into a framework where people are having to exit what they've considered in the real breadwinners and allocate toward people they've been frustrated with. It's the time to do it, but contrarianism is always difficult in, in, a, in a client dynamic. It's, it's a very behavioral issue as far as the behavioral it elements is. of investors. Is there anything that you particularly deal with from in convincing investors to do that? Is there a particular way or method to do that, or do you just continually show evidence and your idea generation process and why you think you're right? A category of investors receives you know, valuation work and uh, you know thoughtful sort of fundamental work well so showing people you know, here's the valuation case here's where we started here's where we went uh, helps a lot but I think the, the bigger help to us has been in the initial framing of the investment discussions with clients this goes back to the behavioral finance aspects that we talked about when we frame a mandate with people we don't talk just about uh, what kind of risk they want to bear during the mandate we talk about what success means in good markets and in difficult markets we talk about time horizons and exits. And having that discussion up front and then documenting that discussion gets people to a point where they've, they've had to reflect on the event before the emotions tie them to it. Having that as a basis for uh, the cell discussion is, is critically important.